Hello, conference goers. I'm Josh, and today I am introducing Catherine Ullman. Um, Catherine is, Dr. Catherine J. Ullman is a security researcher, speaker, and senior information security forensic analyst at University at Buffalo with over 20 years of highly technical experience. In her current role, Kathy is a data forensics and incident response specialist, a DFER specialist, um, performing incident management, intrusion detection, investigative services, and personnel case resolution in a dynamic academic environment. She additionally builds security awareness among faculty and staff via department-wide program, which educates and informs users about how to prevent and detect social engineering attacks and how to compute and digitally communicate safely. Kathy has presented at numerous prestigious information security conferences, including DEF CON and Hacker Halted. Um, in her minimal spare time, she enjoys visiting her adopted two-toed sloth flash at the Buffalo Zoo, uh, researching death and the dead, and learning more about hacking things to make the world a more secure place. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Catherine. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. Uh, welcome conference goers. Uh, thank you so much for coming to hear me speak. We're gonna talk a little bit today about uh, incident communications and when you have to break the bad news uh, because there's been an incident and now you have to communicate something about it. What I have found, generally speaking, is that people are really, really good about talking about before there's an incident and they're pretty good at talking about cleaning up for an in, during, I'm sorry, after an incident, but not during an incident. So that's effectively what we're going to talk about today. So here's our agenda. We'll do a little intro of, about me. Uh, you'll meet my sloth. Uh, well, one of my sloths. Uh, we'll talk about why any of this matters the strengths and weaknesses of the kinds of things I see in the information security community, communicating at multiple levels. Then we'll talk a little bit about nonverbal communication because it's not just communicating, speaking to each other, it's what we're not saying as well. And then I'll give you some final thoughts. So here's a little bit about me. Well, first I'll let you see, this was my sloth named Minnie. Uh, she was one of the first sloths that I adopted from the Buffalo Zoo. She has kind of a gimpy foot. If you look kind of carefully, you can see that uh, she's missing a couple claws. I love sloths, so I always like to start with sloth. But really, this is more about me. I've been at the university for over 20 years. I'm on staff with B-Sides Rochester. I volunteer at a bunch of stuff. I speak at a bunch of places, have some certs and some degrees, and uh, no need to belabor that. So why does any of this matter? Let's talk a little bit about the, the motivation. And I'll just let you know that the, the idea behind this talk is that it's for people in all different areas doing any form of incident response. So whether you're a single person who is responsible for incident response in your organization or you're part of a larger team of people, uh, it doesn't matter. Some piece of this will hopefully be relevant to you. So again, why does any of this matter? Well, Angry Cat says you should care because the odds of there being some sort of a breach or an incident in your environment, they're pretty good, right? So we can see the statistics here show that we had some breaches in 2018. We had uh, consumer records that year were significantly up, even though the number of breaches had gone down slightly from the previous year. In 2019, we see even more breaches. So that's up, even if the number of records are down. Um, and what we see typically is this going back and forth. As of 2020, there's already been 745 breaches. Now, it may look like maybe we're doing a little bit better, but are we really, and is this really indicative? And my argument is probably not. Um, because ultimately, going back and forth, we'll see a few more breaches, and a few less records or lots more records and a few less breaches, but the numbers don't really improve significantly. In 2019, ultimately, we lost a billion records. That's crazy. And that's just, you know, a rough guesstimate. And you can see here, 34 million records expose non-sensitive PII that could you lead to more exposure. So that 1 billion number, um, 
is, you know, total. But of that, even though not all of those records are sensitive PII, a lot of that other data can lead to this problem. So I really like this quote. It's not particularly new, um, but I think it's still accurate. There are only two types of companies, those who have already been hacked or attacked and those who will be, and in some cases, those that are going to be hacked again. So it's better to assume ultimately that you're going to be in one of those categories. And ideally, you want to be prepared when it happens, because really, it's not if, it's when. So let's talk a little bit about our strengths and weaknesses that we're going to be bringing to the table during any kind of incident response. I really love this quote from Bruce Schneier, and it brings the point home that technology is ultimately not the problem here. We can throw technology at the problem all day long, but this is really a people problem. It's a problem that involves people's skills. And that's kind of the point that I'm going to try to get at in a minute. So here's typically what we're really good at doing in information security, uh, no matter what level you are. We're really good at fixing problems, right? When we go in, the thing is broken, we fix the thing. This is something we excel at. What we're not always so good at is explaining to other people who maybe not be technical exactly what the problem was or why it mattered or what was going on in detail. And this becomes a real problem, especially when you're in the middle of an incident, because you're going to have people at all different levels that you might be talking to, and you need to know how to communicate information to them, and in some cases, how to get information from them in order to respond to something. And you know, um, be efficient at it and be effective in your response. Uh, for those of you who may remember, this was a skit from Saturday Night Live with the computer guy who was very fond of saying, move, uh, instead of asking his, the folks that he's doing support for to, you know, can I, can I please use your keyboard or, um, you know, some more polite way of getting access to their system to, to help them out. One of the areas that we don't typically excel at in, in security and in information um, technology in general is patience. It can sometimes be very frustrating, whether you're dealing with an end user, you're dealing with management, um, you're dealing with your own colleagues, we wind up being frustrated. And when we are, we sometimes take it out on each other. Uh, sometimes you take it out on yourself. And, and none of those things are particularly useful. Patience is really important. The repercussions of all of these things are ultimately this potential loss of trust. You might have difficulty communicating in the future. You could wind up with you know, some kind of additional conflict as a result. What if whatever occurs, whatever kind of incident you're dealing with and the poor communication that results from it ultimately gives you a negative impact on your company's reputation or a decrease in morale and certainly elevated stress. So it's problematic when we're not communicating well. All right, so here comes the actual example that I want to give. And Again, this is an example of an incident that people are running into all the time. It's not the be all end all. Ideally, you should be able to take all of this information, apply it to other kinds of incidents or potential incidents. But I thought this one was particularly well known and that would be ransomware. So let's assume your organization has been hit with ransomware. And many of you probably, if you've been in this business for more than five seconds, you've seen this. And maybe even if you haven't been in this business long, maybe somebody you know was hit with ransomware. Some form of crypto locker or a bad rabbit. You can see these are just each screenshots of what you might expect to see if, in fact, you, your machine or machines in your organization were hit with some sort of um, crypto mining or ransomware. So now what do you do? Well, now you know you have a problem, right? And uh, it's not a good one to have. 
it's really tempting to panic and freak out because that's often the first response most people have. Oh no, we have ransomware. This is really bad. We've got to do something. Let's hurry up and fix it. Well, realistically, that doesn't help. So what you're going to have to do now is you're going to need to communicate something about that incident. You have to communicate what you know to people who don't necessarily understand the technology that you understand. And in some cases, you're going to be communicating with people who do know what you know about technology, but maybe they just don't know as much about the particular incident or ransomware. So we're going to take a look at different levels of your organization. And as I stated in the beginning, the idea here is that regardless of whether you're responsible for various levels within your organization, or you're only responsible maybe for one level, so just your end users or just management, this could apply to you in either case. Now, I didn't mention at the beginning of this talk, but feel free to, to throw questions into the chat at any time, and we will get to them at the end. But don't feel like you have to wait till the very end to ask the question, because I know from personal experience, if I wait, sometimes I forget my questions. So um, just a, a side note there, please feel free to throw questions as, as they come up to you, and we will answer them at the end. Okay, so these are our different audiences typically, right? We're gonna look at our end user, our mid-level management, and our executives. And what you need to understand is that ultimately you wanna frame that conversation in terms of what is important to each one of these levels for how you're going to communicate with them. Think about the kinds of questions that they might want to ask in advance so that you're not sidelined when those questions inevitably come up. So also consider how you're going to communicate with them. Maybe the best way is to use some kind of internal website. Maybe you need to actually put a presentation together and sit down and give it to them. What about email? Is email the proper way? It kind of depends in part on the particular example that you're dealing with, right? If our email is compromised, is that really a good way to send this information? Probably not. How about in person? Maybe it needs to be a one-on-one -on -one with somebody. And of course, lawyer-proof pigeon carriers, that's always a good option. So now let's, let's first talk about the end user as the type of individual that you might need to provide information for. So an end user is typically going to focus on how it's going to impact getting their individual jobs done. What you need to make sure to explain to them is what happened and why. That doesn't mean you have to tell them every single detail, but you should give them a basic idea of what's going on. It's an opportunity to provide awareness training, both for work and home. Show it as some kind of benefit to them. I frequently explain to people why they should do things a certain way to be safer online, not because I just want them to be safer with university data, but it's a good habit to get into because if they're doing these things at work and at home, they're more likely to be consistent, right? So if you tell them, gee, you know, this bad thing happened and here's why, and here are the kinds of things that perhaps could help prevent it from happening to them at home, they will remember that, or at least they are more likely to remember that than if they just think it's about work. You want to make sure that you are using effective and efficient communication whenever you can, and it should be continuous. You don't want to just tell them once and then never follow up with them again. So what do I mean by effective and efficient? So this is what I mean by that. Be concise. Less is more. And that's what I meant earlier by you want to tell them the how and the why, but you don't want to tell them a huge long story. Tell them what they need to know, how it applies to them. Don't blame management. Be judicious. So, you know, don't give them irrelevant information, all kinds of details maybe about who clicked on what or what wasn't done properly. What do they need to know to move forward with their day? And as I mentioned earlier, patience is critical. Even if you ultimately have to go into a closet later to scream and tear your hair out, 
please be patient with them. In many cases, end users are uncomfortable and they're upset when they hear about any sort of uh, breach or incident because they don't really know how it's going to impact them. This is really the best practice to get into with all levels. Make sure that however you're communicating, it's some way that your end user can understand and relate to. Don't speak over them and don't speak down to them. Be right on their level. This is what we don't want to see when you're communicating with end users, right? Don't be screaming at them. Don't get mad. Even if perhaps you're speaking to an end user who made a mistake that ultimately caused the incident, it doesn't help anybody. Be upfront and honest. This whole idea of lying to children, well, we're just going to placate them and tell them something for now. It will come back to bite you, so don't do that. You want to make sure that when you're talking to these folks, you address any fear, uncertainty, and doubt that they may have. As I mentioned a moment ago, they're often very uncomfortable. They don't know what it might mean for them, especially in an instance where maybe that end user is the person who clicked the thing or you know, allowed something on the network that shouldn't be there. Um, you want to make sure that <clears throat> they understand that you know these things do happen you you, you can't 100 percent prevent all of the things but you certainly can provide a learning experience remember that for most end users and i really would say this for anybody perception is reality there is no distinction what they perceive to be the case is the case for them and what that means is you need to listen to what they're telling you, even if you know what they're telling you isn't really a problem or doesn't really impact anything um, to do directly with that incident. Listen, you never know what you might learn that could still help you. All right, moving on. Let's talk a little bit about middle management. All right, middle management wants everybody to calm down. This is great, right? Let's talk a little bit about communicating with them and what their focus is. They're typically focused on business processes. Now, obviously, again, this is going to depend in great part on the size of your organization. But usually, you wind up having various departments, operations, IT, HR, et cetera. And those mid-level managers are going to be responsible for those departments and thus their particular uh, areas are going to be the focus of their concerns. Once again, you need to talk to them at a level they can understand and relate to, which ultimately, if it's not IT, you don't want to use IT language specifically to talk to those managers. So technical terms with HR typically doesn't fly very far because it's not their specialty. So make sure that you're not using jargon with them. And frankly, that's true for any level. This is how we don't want to communicate with mid-level managers, right? We don't want it to be the headless chicken syndrome where we're like, oh no, this bad thing happened. It's the end of the world. What are we going to do? All right. So let's talk about ideal mid-level managers. If we had an ideal middle manager, their skill set is going to include a number of things. They're going to be great at delegating. They're going to have fantastic interpersonal skills. They're kind of very effective communication skills. They're going to be, fan, you know, absolutely spectacular at negotiating. Their emotional intelligence will be quite high, and they'll be influencers. The problem that I've run into is finding these ideal middle managers. Now, I've given this talk a few times, and I will tell you, I've had people come back and tell me, oh no, I have an ideal middle manager. And that's amazing. And if you're one of those people, congratulations. And boy, congratulations to those managers. Because that's a really hard road. And you know, if, if you've got folks who are really good at it, kudos to them and, and fantastic for you. In my experience, they are few and far between. So really, we're going to be engaging with these regular middle management. Regular middle management has it tough. Everybody below them, or at least a good chunk of people, would like to move up, 
right? You, if you're not in management, there are a lot of people that really want to be in management and that's how you get there. You go from some level beneath them into middle management. Middle management, in many cases, would like to move up that food chain and the people above them are trying to keep them down. It is a very, very challenging job because not only are the people below you trying to get to you and you want to get up and the people above you want to keep you down, but it is often the case that you get blamed from both sides. So ultimately, you want to be supportive of these managers. And to that end, you want to come with an action plan. This is where you don't want to be running around with a chicken, like a chicken with your head cut off. You want to come to them and say, okay, we know this is what's gone wrong. And this is how not only we're going to handle the problem or, or the next steps for the problem, but here's how we're going to communicate those things, both up and down the chain, right? In both directions, because your end users, remember, we don't want to keep them in the dark. And the folks above middle management, they're going to need to know stuff too. So if you can help those middle managers with that plan, that will be immensely in your favor. Empathy is critical here. Something that uh, InfoSec Sherpa frequently talks about is the importance of empathy. And as I've already mentioned, mid-management is hard. It is a challenging role. So if you can make those folks look good, it will come back to you usually tenfold. The plan that I was talking about should include the description of the incident. So what exactly happened here? Make sure you include all of your stakeholders, not just your internal stakeholders, but your external ones as well. And that means understanding who those people might be in advance, which requires sometimes doing a little research. Make sure that you discuss recovery options and timeframes. Is this something you're going to be able to recover from in, say, a day or a week? Or is it going to take multiple weeks? And could it happen again? What is the reality of that happening, you know, in another week or another? Could this happen? And be honest about that. Because the worst thing you can do is say, oh, yeah, no problem. We'll have this cleaned up in a week. And two weeks go by and three weeks go by and it's not handled yet. So, you know, it, it's not uncommon to maybe pad that time frame a little, but don't make it ridiculously long or ridiculously short. Be realistic. Consider the reduction of potential reoccurrences as I mentioned. And, you know, what's the end goal here? Is the end goal just involving the A machine, is it involving a portion of your network? Make sure you're clear on that. And this plan for action should tell you how to get from A to Z. Okay, this is a tough one. Necessary accountability. Management needs to take responsibility for their users' behavior. And I don't mean that management should go around blaming people. That's not the point of the slide. The idea is that management needs to understand that if their users are not following proper procedures, that that reflects badly on them. So they need to be aware that it's their responsibility to make sure that their users' behavior is appropriate. Yes, I understand. You can't 100% ever get everybody to do all the things. But they need to be aware that they play a role in that. So, so here are some really important questions that mid-level management, um, these are the kinds of things that they need to consider. And these are questions that you should have them thinking about in advance. So you may want to sit down with them long before there's ever an incident, with the assumption someday there probably will be. How are ransom payments going to be handled? In this day and age, we're now seeing more and more situations with ransomware where it's not just paying the ransom to unlock the data. It's paying the ransom because otherwise they'll take unencrypted data and give it to the world. Also not ideal. So have them thinking about both situations and what they're going to do. 
it should never be a last minute, well, should we pay or shouldn't we pay? Ultimately, it's going to depend on the situation, but these conversations should happen sooner rather than later just to prepare for it. Ultimately, you want to coach and encourage some form of collaboration. In a situation such as this, is it appropriate for them to manage a situation or maybe delegate a portion of it? Maybe they're good at delegating, but they need somebody else to do negotiating. There are certain instances where bringing in somebody to negotiate a situation with ransomware can be very helpful. So just you know, keep those things in mind. All right, let's move to the top of the food chain, our executives. With your executives, you're going to have very little time to talk to them. They are super busy folks, not that the end users and the mid-management folks aren't super busy, but your C-level or your, your executive folks typically are some of the busiest people and their time is really precious. Their focus is usually on big picture. So the goals and reputation of the company, its performance, some kind of vision. So when you're going to talk to them, you need to think, this is going to get, I'm going to have 30 seconds in an elevator. As if you walk into that elevator, you're going to talk to them until they reach their floor and that's it. So how are you going to do that? Do your homework. You need to know who is your audience, know something about them so that you can prepare this information in advance. You want to enter and exit gracefully. Don't freak out. Don't be upset. Try to calm your own nerves when you're speaking to them. Don't get mad if you don't like what they're telling you, hence the exit gracefully part. You're going to try to present and discuss your ideas strategically, strategically from their point of view, which is going to be this bigger picture. And remember, at the end of the day, these folks are people too. They have lives and frequently kids and pets, and you know they just want to go home like anyone else. So be aware of that and try to be patient with them. Here are the things that they're ultimately going to want to know. They're going to probably want a non-technical description of what and when it happened, because most of them are not going to be technical folks. Make sure you give them the best and worst case scenarios, along with what's most likely to be the case. The idea is that they can see, here's the extreme, here's you know the best case where we don't really have as big a problem, but where we really are likely to stand. And make sure you provide the consequences. So, all right, we were hit with ransomware. Here's the consequences of exactly what was hit and maybe what kind of data was affected, how big this all is, um, you know, the underlying cause or causes of the incident, which doesn't necessarily mean Sally Smith in accounting clicked a thing. It can be more generic where, you know, we have, we've had an issue where, a piece of email came in, it had a malicious link in it, and somebody clicked on it leading to et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so providing that underlying cause doesn't have to be super technical. And in some cases, it may not, it may not be in your best interest to give them the, the individual's name or a specific people unless they really want to know. But they're going to want to understand those things. Do not use geek speak. Again, this is very similar to what we talked about before with mid-managers and really with, with all users. Use plain English. They need to understand exactly what you're talking about in a typically a non-technical way. So which executives are you going to make sure to talk to? Well, if you're in a small company, that's going to be fairly easy, right? Because there probably aren't very many. But if you're in an, or an organization that's a little larger, Make sure your message gets to all of these folks, finance, operations, marketing, technology, uh, and there may be others in your organization, but these are typically the, the four that are critical, right? Finance, in case there's a financial impact of ransomware operations, because obviously this could impact data. Your marketing team, because if somebody finds out that you have 
there has been some sort of ransomware or breach, they're going to need to spin that in some way. Uh, and technology, because clearly you're dealing with technology on some level. Okay, so you've done your best to communicate with these various levels. And communication is a two-way street. Right now, I am unfortunately not really communicating with you because all I'm able to do is provide a message. Now, once I get into the Q&A, hopefully I'll get into some feedback. And it's really feedback that provides that other way. So we need two ways. Uh, for there to be any sort of real communication. And we need to determine, was the message that you're sending to whoever you're speaking with, was it accepted? Was it received? Do they understand? One of the ways you can tell is through nonverbal communications. So that's why we're going to talk about that as sort of the last portion of this talk. Pay close attention to body language. With small children, it's really obvious, right? We look at these pictures, we can see which one's upset, which one's surprised, which one's angry, which one's a little curious about what's going on, which one is very sure of himself, right, or herself. Um, we, we want to pay attention to these various elements because they're going to provide that feedback. Body language includes not just our body movements, but facial expressions, our posture, gestures, handshakes, even breathing. So it's pretty broad. Now, how do we go about interpreting these visual cues? What in, happens in the case of raised eyebrows? So if my eyebrows are raised like this, is that a case where I'm uncomfortable with the situation? Is it just I'm really surprised? Or am I doubting what I'm hearing? What about if I'm staring directly at you, right? Excessive eye contact. Is it lying eyes? Am I doing that to try to hide something? Or is there real interest? Because whatever you're saying is, you know, super interesting to me. What about the motions of my arms and legs? If they're crossed or uncrossed? Imagine that my arms are crossed or my legs are crossed. Is it because I'm resistant to what you're telling me or is it just really cold in the room? And what about if I'm nodding a lot, right? I'm doing this. Um, is this me being anxious about approval or am I really excited? As you can see, each one of these things can be interpreted in different ways and that can be a real challenge. So we have to do what's called synthesize these nonverbal cues. Any one of those individual cues is really ultimately open for possible misinterpretation. So instead, we want to take them collectively. You want to make some observations, and you want to sort of put them all together. So the example I provided here is imagine you see somebody with raised eyebrows, and their eyes are, their eyes are moving around a lot. They're gripping hard on something. Those things together probably mean some form of discomfort. So each one of those, as we saw, could be misleading, but bring them all together, and usually we can have a pretty good idea of what direction and how to interpret them. All right, some final thoughts. I'm done a little earlier than I usually am because I often get a lot of questions through this presentation, but here we go. I believe very strongly that in the InfoSec universe, we should be a judgment-free zone. Our job as security people is to educate. We don't adjudicate them. We don't judge them. We teach them. Learn what other folks know and trade back your knowledge. One of my favorite stories and places that I worked in the past was a, a government contracting facility where folks were actual rocket science scientists. And I'm sure many of you, you know, have heard the expression, oh, it's not rocket science. Well, you know what? These folks were rocket scientists and they were brilliant. But you know what they weren't always good at? Making their computer go. Um, some of them were 
really good with like the particular system that they had to use to create the elements of whatever it was that manufacturing was creating for them. So whether it was a high-end Unix machine or um, maybe uh, they were doing some sort of drawing of a part and they were very proficient with those things. But turning a Windows machine on and using email, that was not their forte. And so we traded information. I would teach them a little more about how their Windows machine worked or how their email functioned or any one of a number of things. And they taught me a little bit about being a rocket scientist. You never know what these folks can teach you. And if you can build a really good rapport with them, you will have a much, much better time ultimately being able to communicate with them. We see a lot of folks in this industry who are rough around the edges, who have trouble communicating. We can't necessarily fix them, but we can control ourselves, right? You, you can't control others, but you can control your responses to them. So be that change you wish to see in the world. If you don't like how security people have been to you in the past, if you don't like how you see that, be the kind of person that you'd like to see out there. And ideally, folks will begin to emulate you and perhaps we'll see more of that. And with that, we'll go to some questions. Do uh, we have questions? We do have questions. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, and I'll start with one here. So um, what would your advice for a new person breaking into security be and is looking to sharpen their communication skills? So there are a couple of things that I'd recommend. I mean, as far as getting into security, you really want to understand the basics. And by basics, I mean basic networking, basic systems administration, so that you understand how things work under the hood. That's probably the most important thing I would say from a technical perspective. In terms of communications, Spend more time thinking about when you're sending an email and think about the people that you're sending it to. What I find is that we often send email where it's hurried and it's not thought through and there are a lot of bits and pieces missing. Get good at explaining technical things to non-technical people in a way they'll understand. Practicing with friends and neighbors is a great way to do that because you probably already know, even if you're not in security directly, more than they do. So the more you can explain to them and ask them for feedback, the more you will learn. But really spending time on, on practicing any kind of, of writing that involves communication. So writing a letter, sending an email. If you, if you get a chance to be on a project where you can write some documentation for something. Documentation, I know for a lot of people can be really boring, but it can also be, you know, really illustrative and help you understand, for example, why things are not um, communicated to the person who's reading them in a way that is helpful. Hopefully that helps. I think so. Yeah. Um, second question. So what are the overlaps and differences regarding communications between crisis communication and uh, requirements UX UI engineering? Um, can we learn from our customer facing colleagues about crisis communication? I think so. Um, I mean, so I've been a volunteer firefighter for, well, since 1997. And I do think that, um, I use a lot of the communication skills that I have in those situations. I think where they tend to overlap are, you know, is this FUD area, right? People are fearful. There's uncertainty about what's happened and, you know, doubt about what they're hearing. So I, I'd have to say that's probably where I see the greatest overlap. Um, there is certainly a lot of information out there about crisis. Claire Tills is the person who comes to mind. She did a fair amount of research on that subject and uh, wrote her master's thesis on 
the sort of differences between traditional crisis management and communications in the infosec space. So I would strongly encourage you to go check out her work um, because she's one of the people I know who's who's done the most research. So hopefully that's helpful. Thank you. Um, oh. Catherine, do you recommend providing any specific templates for defer or for end users in terms of reporting security events? Templates. I think it depends on your organization. Um, I think they can be very helpful if you can create a template that is generic enough that people can use it for reporting and still, if you know, and still flexible enough that if there's something really unusual, they have a way to include some of those different um, and difficult details. Uh, it's because it's really going to depend on the incident, right? You probably will want to include some basics about, you know, what they're seeing and um, what the first indicators were. It's, but honestly, it's going to depend greatly on your infrastructure and your the size of your particular environment as to, you know, how that's going to work for you. I, I, I mean, I think having a baseline to start with is a great idea, but to, I can't give you specific recommendations other than, you know, make sure there's the, a way for you to continue once that person has filled out that form to communicate with them and whatever you do, don't drop the ball. So if, if somebody sends you something, you know, one of these templates that says, you know, I've seen this thing and I'm concerned about it. As I mentioned earlier on, make absolutely certain that you follow through with them. Because no matter what level of an organization you're talking to, follow through is critical. Um, this is actually a question for me. Sure. Um, so um, when you are looking for software to help you with defer and particularly with coordination with your team um, and with management, like what kind of stuff are you looking for? I'll be honest, we don't really use any sort of specialized software. There, there are some great packages. The trickiest thing I would say in terms of, of defer and communications and software is that you need something that has very granular permissions. Um, many years ago, we used a product that was a nightmare. I don't even remember what it's called now, but it was a nightmare to administer. But at the time, it was the only thing that will, would allow the security office to see all kinds of technical details about whatever incident we were dealing with, but wouldn't necessarily allow the whole rest of the, um, the other teams to see everything. So if you're working, let's say, with a third party like law enforcement, there may be some very sensitive pieces of information that maybe it can't even be logged because for national security, it, it can't go anywhere. Maybe it's just, um, you know, maybe it does involve some data that has specialized restrictions. So I think the most difficult thing is making sure that you sort of separate some of those details if you don't have a package that can have really granular permissions. Uh, in our institution, there are only four of us in the security office. So most of what happens is that we talk amongst ourselves. I will usually write up some form of report if we've had anything of uh, real significance. And then my supervisor will, will pass that report along and that report won't have any of those sensitive details in it. But it's really going to depend greatly on your institution. Um, there are, like I said, there are packages out there that uh, that have that level of granularity. But I, I think that's probably key because you don't want to be putting anything into those programs that could be used against you in some capacity later on. So I hope that's kind of what you were looking for. Yeah, that actually is really helpful. Great. Um, I am going to look through the chat here just to make sure that we didn't miss any questions from anyone. Do, do, do. I don't think we did. I think that's about it. Okay. Well, cool. Thank you so much for speaking. Um, that was that was an excellent talk. Um, we really appreciate you coming. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, everybody have a good rest of your day. Yes, and thank you all. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you again for coming to hear me. I am Investigator Chi because Investigator Chick is one letter too long for Twitter. Uh, so if you actually put in Investigator Chick, you will see that it just 
cuts that letter off. Uh, feel free to, to, you know, tweet at me um, or reach out to me if you have further questions. And I hope you guys have a great day too. Awesome. See you all. Goodbye. Bye.